My name is Ben Chandler. I'm with the Appalachian Regional Planning Council, and uh, we, along with all the other sponsors, want to again thank each and every one of you for being here today. We hope this has been beneficial, that you've been learning something new, as we all have, and uh, we look forward to going through this process with you all together. We learned about the rules and regs and the research this morning, and now it's time to talk about the business of growing and the processing of hemp. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for this particular session, Commissioner Jim Peacock with Jackson County. Uh, he's uh, also a, a longstanding and strong uh, member of our Appalachian Regional Planning Council board, and so we want to thank him for all his efforts there. And uh, we also, sir, want to thank you for your many, many years of service in keeping our country safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. With that, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you. We're going to do things a little different. We're going to uh, be informal and hopefully informative. Uh, I have three gentlemen here with me this afternoon on the panel and that are in the business. Uh, hopefully they can answer a lot of the questions that you may have about production, about uh, a lot of things that uh, hasn't been covered thus far. I'm very interested in the uh, hemp industry because Jackson County uh, has a very large agricultural population. About 60% of our economy is agricultural driven. So uh, to me, it means a lot. We produce a lot of row crops over there and we were devastated by Hurricane Michael. We have thousands of acres of pines that were blown down. And never mind the hardwoods, uh, but uh, there's a lot of land in our county that uh, would be suitable for uh, converting over to hemp. And someone was asking, how much will it cost? Yeah, well, that depends on uh, the uh, amount of damage you had. If the, all the trees are down, you're probably looking from anything from $500 to $2,500 per acre to clear the land, get it ready uh, to be uh, farmed for hemp. But uh, you may find somebody that'll do it for a lot more, but uh, I like the cheap guys. Uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is we're just going to go down the list, uh, the row here, and uh, let these gentlemen introduce themselves and uh, then we'll come back and each one of them will make a statement uh, of a few minutes about their perspective on hemp and what they're doing and uh, allow you to ask questions. Okay, Robert, you want to start? Certainly, thank you. Am I live? <laughs> hey guys. My name is Robert Tornello. Um, some of you know me from the past. Um, some of the different speaking engagements I've had, some with Jeff Sharkey. Um, my background has always been horticulture. I've been a farmer my entire life. Um, I started uh, actually in ag uh, in Florida back in 72, um, and it was in the ornamental uh, nursery industry. Um, did a design build company where I was doing um, parks, uh, zoos, theme parks around the country and eventually around the globe. Um, key issues for any grower always is knowing your market, um, knowing what you do, how, how you're going to do it, and, uh, and knowing who your customers are. And in my case, um, they were diverse. They covered zones from zone two uh, up in North Nova Scotia area down to tropical areas uh, in zone 11, 11 A and B. Um, so you have to learn all about the genetics of plants, how these plants react and they grow, and how they're going to perform in your particular zone or geographic area, and then how it's multi-crop. Uh, because I've heard today a few times uh, discussions about how many crops could you guys expect. And in my opinion, I don't think you should ever stop. I think you should be able to continue to grow never, I mean, 24-7, 12 months out of the year. Because we have such a diverse genetic bank of seeds, clones, and plant material to choose from that we can meet any of your microclimates, zones, or, any, or even your particular soil types by the genetics of what we know are out there and some of the ones that we've been working ourselves with. Because my background now, after I went through 
the ornamental stages. And then when the economy crashed, I had to keep 22 employees working full time, just like a lot of you guys have the same issue right now with the, the timber industry uh, being collapsed there, is what do you do next? And so I went, because of my organic background, um, I went into organic farming. I starved to death, but I kept my employees working for four years. And during that period of time, I was able to apply for a license under uh, uh, Senate Bill 1030, uh, which moved on and morphed, but the bottom line was I ended up with a cannabis license. Um, and during that time, you know, we've learned so much um, about what you're about to learn. Um, and it is just about the diversity of the genetics, where these plants come from, and how they can apply to your different applications. Now, in our case, we were regulated on THC levels, not on zero THC. When we even started, it was 0.08 with low THC plants. So we were looking at a lot of these different phenotypes of um, what gives us a really nice cannabinoid uh, profile, um, which are good for patients, but at the same time, at that early time, didn't pop that 0.08 um, THC level. Well, there was quite a few out there, but when you start getting into these varieties, um, what we learned was that they, if we, come, if we start with seed to start with, which most of the cases we had to bring in because we couldn't transport any plants over the state lines, um, we found very early on that seed variations, even from one mother or from that particular plant, and that even that flower itself, could be as much as, if we got 100 seeds there, we could have 70 different phenotypes because of all the different genetics and backgrounds of all the parents that were crossbred into them. And what that means is, well, and what we were looking for was uh, different profiles in the, this cannabinoid profile and different things that were medicine. But at the same time, we were always checking the THC levels, which we in the hemp industry are going to be very aware of and have to monitor. So what I'm about to say, which I also was discussing a little bit earlier, is that these varieties um, that we're bringing in that are, as we see them right now, if it is seed, that's at 0.03, um, expect a lot of different genetics within that seed variance. You're gonna see, yes, if they're feminized seeds, they should only be all females, great. But there's still gonna be different levels of THC that are gonna be found in there. So then we get back to testing. How do we verify those numbers to make sure that they're correct? Well, I can tell you before I go into some of these other things and answer questions, which I'm sure you guys are gonna have a million of, is in the testing part of cannabis, we can take one flower that we know is supposed to be 18% THC and maybe 1 or 2% CBD and maybe CBG or some of these other different phytocannabinoids and they're at different levels and we'll send it out to three different testing labs. And we'll get three different, very different tests back or results back. Um, a lot of times um, some of the phytocannabinoids that we know are there and part of the genetic profile don't show up. Other times we'll see THC levels as much as two or three points above what we know or as much as three to five points below. So the question is then, what protocols are they using for their testing? What equipment are they using? Uh, now there's a lot of different testing equipment out there from liquid uh, chromatography to, um, to, of course, mass spectrometry, which is very expensive. Um, and you start getting, breaking everything down, and not parts per thousandth or millionth, but to parts per billionth, or trillionth even, and to, to make sure that what we're looking for, is, especially with regard to pesticides, is if you're growing this thing for a flower to go into a CBD oil, or to be a, what's considered a smokable flower, all CBD, these plants are going to have to be tested because they are gonna be consumed. Um, so you're gonna to have to get these full profile tests done. Some of them are quite expensive, um, as we've learned. But the point is, we find there's huge variances and swings on even the TAC level. So now we, let's take this back down to 0.03. If, if we see swings as much as one or two points, um, which are, how, how are you gonna, to mitigate swings that are within a thousandth or a hundredth of a point, um, when we already know that the testing itself out there is not 100% accurate. So these are some of the things that I need to just state to fellow growers. You know, 
as you put products in, first of all, not only know where your genetics are coming from, is then look at are clones available that are tested and certified for this particular use? Or is tissue culture available? Is that a viable option? Um, you know, because each has its own pluses and minuses. They also have different costs associated with it. So if you're doing uh, broadcast or row crops, um, you know, planting out individual small plants may be very costly. But seed is then a viable option. But then make sure that the crops that you're growing or looking at growing are potentially for biomass production, for pulp, or for um, other uses, but not necessarily a consumable use that could fall into that, that, that 0.03 level where you, you, get a, you have a more costly plant that you then have to then at the last minute find out you may be out of tolerance. And even with a lot of hard effort, um, you may not be able to bring it within that range. And if you've got a destruction order and now you've put a fair amount of money into something, you're going to be quite upset, um, as will anybody else associated with that. Um, so if you have to borrow money, borrow only when you're learning. The one thing I tell everybody is only borrow what you could afford to lose. You know, it's like anything, anything else. I mean, this is a new industry to a lot of people. Go small. Start small, learn the product, see how good of a grower you are. Learn some of the different variations. Learn also pests and different diseases that are going to be very prevalent that are now that you've never maybe never seen in the current crop you're growing, all of a sudden now may be prevalent in the hemp crop. There's one book I'm going to recommend to you, and only one, and it's from um, an old guy that I know I've known for years, Dr. Robert McPartland. And it's it's not uh, Portland, it's Partland. M-C-P-A-R-T-L-A-N-D. And it's called The Hemp Diseases and Pest Book. And it's basically a handbook. I, uh, you know, I probably got that in my library 20 years ago. And he's, he's made updates on it. It's about a $100 book. But it goes into every single different type of mold, bacteria, smut, insect, disease, um, anything that he's discovered as uh, a biologist and, a, and as a scientist across the board all over the world. Um, he's also on the, uh, on the board and as a consultant with GW Pharmaceuticals in Europe. So he's very well uh, known, a uh, very smart man, but his book in its simplicity is, should be always in your pickup truck <laughs> or in your field um, so you, you get to see it. Um, I know we'll have a lot of the questions, and I'm not going to cover everything today that I want to talk to you about, but um, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, the banking uh, industry. Um, some of the other things you need to re realize, and something that I've run into personally, is that if with the cannabis industry and any association with cannabis, all of a sudden you're kind of like red flagged. You know? um, so I found that even, uh, as mentioned to a few bankers, even before I got in this industry, um, like my retirement uh, account, some accounts that I had set up uh, for my kids and various other things. Because of my name now popping a red flag up and because being in the cannabis industry, those banks, even with money that I earned from the horticulture industry or farming industry, shut me down. Um, it's like, so you have to be very, very aware of where your money comes in from. So, and as a perfect example is, if you have a, a flower crop that you're growing um, and it's for smokable flour, if you sell that product, and this is something you need to talk to your attorney and your accountant about and your banker, um, and always be truthful with them because this is going to come back to at you. If that flour is sold to a producer like myself um, at Three Boys Farm, as an example, and we write you a check from our cannabis business for that. That, those funds technically, even though it was for a legitimate product that you had to sell, the, where those funds derive from, from selling legal cannabis or anything else, all of a sudden you are part of that, that follow through line. So you need to be aware of that. All of a sudden you can, by selling a product to a cannabis company or to a broker that eventually goes through to them, you may find yourself in a banking situation where some of those funds that were brought in to that account or your account, even though you assume they were clean, technically were traced back to an industry that is under banking regulations um, or federal banking regulations. So be aware of these things. Ask a million questions. Um, you know, and also be 
just be careful, do what you need to do. And I remember you asked a question about equipment. And that's where co-ops really come in handy. Because, um, but there's one thing that I also mentioned to Jeff earlier. There's the guys in Canada, north of us, in Manitoba have been growing um, a fin oil seed for years. And it's a very small plant, tremendous amount of seed mass. Um, it's not grown for anything other than seed production. Almost all of the, the, the uh, organic and the healthy um, hemp crushed hemp shell uh, seed that you see like at, uh, at the grocery stores, that's mostly produced in Canada. The United States actually consumes over 90% of what they produce up there. Um, that is another plant that seasonally can be grown here and very easily cut with a typical harvester or even a hay baler, um, like you would use for just rolling grass. You know, so, um, so there's a lot of different varietals that you can use, but the point is they are gonna be seasonal. Um, so you'll have to have that as part of your rotational crop. Um, so okay. we're going to move on, but I'll be around. And, and I came up here mainly because there's going to be a lot of questions for everybody. And if there's questions that you have that we can't answer on this panel and you need to see me later, I'd be more than willing to share as much information as I can and put you in the right direction with some of the testing labs and the other people that hopefully can help you. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. David. Yes, thank, thank you, Robert. Sorry. <laughs> Never enough time. <laughs> I, I, I was listening too, so it was good. Um, hi, my name is David Hasenauer. I'm the CEO of Greenpoint Research. Uh, we're a hemp biomass originator and processor, uh, but we focus primarily on uh, germplasm development. We have existing breeding operations in Colorado on the western slope, as well as down outside of Bogota in Colombia. Uh, we're also doing tissue culture down there. Um, uh, we're very excited. We've been in the hemp space since 2016. We've, we've grown steadily and we're excited to enter the Florida market. Uh, and uh, Robert did a great job of, of touching on most of the, the hot button issues in the industry, but I, I'd really like to reiterate the importance of the seeds. Uh, you know, it all, it all starts with good seeds, and if you don't have good seeds, you, you're going to lose your money. Uh, there's just a, a $44 million lawsuit out of Oregon over bad seeds that weren't feminized, that were improperly advertised. So it is very much a buyer beware scenario uh, due to the nascency of this industry. Um, you should never buy seeds that don't follow strict seed labeling standards. I mean, you wouldn't do that for any of your other agricultural uh, commodities. It, it should be the same here. No one should ever hand you a Ziploc bag of magic beans and tell you you're going to go plant money trees. That, that should immediately say, uh, this is bullshit, sorry for uh, my French, but that should immediately alert you that this is not the real deal. Uh, if, you know, if it doesn't have a, a standardized seed label on it, they're probably not real operators and you want to stay away from them. Uh, and, and so these are kind of the two inherent bottlenecks in the industry are, are, are the seeds, a high supply of quality seeds, and then secondarily is uh, processing. Uh, everything in farming comes to the ability to market your goods. If you can't market your goods, you could grow uh, you know, the best corn in the world, the highest bushel count, whatever, uh, you're still going to go broke because your, field, your crop is going to rot somewhere. Uh, if you can't market your goods, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure you have a good relationship with a processor. Um, there, I mean, that, that's another thing you've seen in the news, especially with uh, the rushed harvest because of the, the winter issues and the, the snowstorms out west. Uh, there's not enough processing capacity, not enough drying capacity uh, out there to support the amount of farmers that have gotten into the industry. And those are, again, are going to be two critical issues here in Florida, so the, the drying and the storage of, of the biomass once it's harvested. Uh, we have a very unique climate. It, it presents a lot of advantages in that our photo period uh, like Robert said, will allow us to grow year-round, especially with efficient nursery operations. Uh, but again, you still have to do something with that biomass on the back end. And if you leave it in the field too long or you transport it too far to your first stage drying, you're going to have major degradation of your material and you're just going to start seeing your profits drop precipitously. Uh, each mile you go further than you should have and the longer you wait to dry it to an acceptable state it is money out of your pocket. Uh, and, and lastly, because of the high price of the seeds uh, currently, especially in phytocannabinoid rich hemp, uh, you know, don't, don't bet the farm unless you got a backup farm to, to plan on next season because it, it will uh, put you out of business. We've seen it all over the country. Uh, like I said, we've grown on the western slope in Colorado, grown in the Hudson Valley in New York, grown in the you know, Piedmont of North Carolina. And consistently, the people that, that don't know what they're going to do after harvest, 
just absolutely wear themselves out and either bankrupt themselves or uh, you know, are getting by on the skin of their teeth to keep the family farm. So while it is very much an exciting new industry, make sure you know your supply chain and make sure you can market your goods before you get started. Let's let Danny say a few words. <laughs> yeah. Well, hi, my name is Danny Prasad. I'm the CEO of Danica Farms, and uh, I'm just going to say what these guys said. <laughs> so, uh, sum it up for you guys. Um, a little bit about us. We got into this space back in uh, 2014. I was called out to Colorado to help them on the banking side of the cannabis industry. And within about two weeks out there, I realized there's a bigger market out here than cannabis. It, it's hemp. So, for the past five and a half, six years, I've been going around everywhere, learning as much as I can about hemp. A lot of the questions you guys asked earlier, I was sitting back there and I was, the people sitting around me, I was answering it for them. Um, as far as, you know, if you're growing plants or male, feminized, you know, if it could go three mile spread and all that stuff. We're doing that up in Maine. So if you want to see me after, I can show you the plants that we're growing right now. They're eight to 10 feet tall, six to eight feet wide. They look like massive Christmas trees. Okay, and I, can, I, can, I have many pictures we're harvesting right now and we're doing extraction at our main location right now as we speak. Um, that's pretty much all I got to say on that part, and uh, I'll wait for some questions. Are you looking to manufacture some products? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, sir. So our goal is to open up a, an extraction facility up in North Florida. Uh, we have several locations we're looking at, a 100,000 square foot facility minimum, uh, up to 200,000 square foot facility. We will then do crude, which pretty much all of us on here is gonna be doing crude. Uh, we can get it all the way down to T-free, uh, if need be. Uh, on the other hand, we'll do fiber. Uh, I heard a, a lady ask about fiber earlier. I was back there. Um, we will do fiber, strip the stock, create fiber, and uh, you know, so we'll have not only the crude side, we'll have a fiber side, and we'll get into the packaging where we will make like packages. If you go to Outback, those to-go packages that they sh send out their styrofoam, we can create those from hemp. There's so many things you can do from hemp, guys. Tremendous, tremendous amount. Chris, are you ready for us to uh, take questions? Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand. Thanks for being here, guys. Um, specific to the, um, Danny, um, on the use of the fiber, mm -hmm for other purposes post crude extraction. Mm -hmm. So it's, where do you see the potential in that marketability versus the cannabinoid extraction? Do you see that as potentially a larger or equivalent market with the 25,000 uses mm -hmm. versus the cannabinoid side? which it seems like everybody's got goggles on that. Sure, so right now the, the end thing is, or the bubble is, everyone's doing CBD. There's CBD everywhere. You know, you go to Walgreens, you can go to 7-Eleven gas station, there's CBD products everywhere. My opinion, this is strictly my opinion, I think the CBD market will go down, it'll be saturated in the next three years. So fiber is where it's at. Uh, you know, more and more of our, our younger generation are definitely going green. Um, they want, you know, everything sustainable energy, uh, fibers and everything right now, um, hemp fiber. So absolutely, I think fiber is, is my end game and, and packaging side. I'd like to say something, you, say, you said post-processing the, the biomass using that fiber. Uh, I, so I don't think that's gonna be a substantial enough volume to be meaningful to any real fiber uh, users. It's gonna be a specialty crop that's grown for fiber. The, the dunnage after extraction, especially depending on uh, the, uh, the extraction process, there's potentially chemical remediation that's gonna have to be done. Uh, like, I know soy and other things, after they do ethanol extraction, they need a special uh, desolventization process before they can put that product out into the atmosphere because of VOCs and EPA regulations. Uh, so there, even that, that scope and being able to use what we call byproduct the, or the waste product, uh, there's significant regulatory hurdles that really haven't even been fleshed out about bringing products from that to market that other industries currently have high hurdles in. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I don't use these very often. Uh, startup cost and operating costs through like your first and second seasons for a somebody doing one, five, ten, hundred acre type deal. Any ideas? 
take that? Or? Does anyone have any yeah, I ideas? I already, I already go I'll jump in. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jim actually had already talked about some of what it's going to cost to clear the land and repair it. Um, but, you know, initial, if you're going to start right bare bottom, right from the beginning, I mean, the first thing that I would do is do um, a really good soil analysis of your soil. Test thoroughly. Um, and, and know what was planted um, in those fields prior and um, how many years they were used for that purpose if they were monocropped. You know, again, if there was something that was a, a Roundup Ready crop, obviously you're going to have glyphosate and some other chemicals that are going to start showing up because hemp is bioremedial. Um, we used to use bamboos and, and other plants, to, which are grasses, to remove toxins from soils uh, on some of these project sites that I had worked on. Um, and I did a lot of stuff with, uh, up in the Carolinas with um, waste management. And, um, and it was just amazing how these plants can take all these different minerals and chemicals that are on the ground and, and toxins and all of a sudden store them in a very efficient vascular bundle and sometimes in foliage. So testing soils are very important. Um, I would never get cheap on there and I wouldn't just take one or two batches. I would take f at least four quadrants of each block and test those individually and, and have a, a plan for that. Um, and once you get an all clear on that, or you don't need a cover crop, um, you know, then look at really the end, the next product that you're going to use. Are you growing for biomass production, or are you going to grow for flour? If you're going to be growing for biomass production, you're going to be able to till the soil, have it ready, look, make sure you're not in a wetland or an area where it's too wet, because most grasses don't like wet feet. They don't like to dry out either, but they, so you're going to have to decide whether you're going to have the cost of doing raised beds with plastic mulch on them, like you would a strawberry crop or, or in any other type of uh, crop, um, or can you just field plant? Um, those are going to have a huge difference in your tractor cost, your plastic cost, and, and man hour, and also whether you have to run netafilm down there. So I would almost look at every, I would look at two or three different scenarios of farming, um, and, and then once you get your test results back, then step back and say, Who's my end user? What am I going to use this product for? And if the end user is not readily available, how am I going to store it for that first season until that processing plant or um, that particular part of the market segment is there um, to support my, my farming operation? Um, storing it is going to be another cost because, uh, as <coughs> you were saying up here earlier, how you harvest this product and how long uh, it takes to properly store it and whether you have freezers, if it's a flower, if you want to go ahead and fully dry it and then vacuum pack it and freeze it so that way it's viable for years, you know, you have that market, that ability. But if it's, if it's just biomass that's going to go into um, supercritical extraction or another b method, um, you know, you have a very short window of where that's going to go. Um, and these costs are high. And I, I think what I'm going to do, um, and don't expect it to be up in the next week or so, but over the next 30 days working with uh, Jeff Sharkey and a few other people here, I think what we'll probably end up doing is maybe creating a website where we can put a lot of questions and answers up um, and give you some different growing scenarios um, and, and try and put some cost to them geographically. Because I know as a farmer, um, and it's, it was always feast or famine. You know, we either had a good crop and made some money, <laughs> and, the, and most of the time when we made some money, we were just trying to pay off all the debts that we accumulated for the three years or so prior that we made nothing. So, you know, so a good plan of action is important, but I think for us, um, we, <coughs> Not that we owe it to an industry, but we've, some of us have been successful because of the industry that supported us. And we need to give back. And I think what we'll try and do, um, and I'll work with Jeff on this, is how we set up um, some portals and some things here where we can answer your questions, put up these things, and get you some real numbers that are viable for Florida, not national numbers, because every state's stats and statistics and, and, and labor pools are different. So. Um, and hopefully that'll be of some value to everybody. So at least save you some money or some losses. The question in the back. Yes. How far can you transport material before it starts losing its value? 
Like if there's not a lab near near you, mm -hmm. how far can you transport before you actually start losing? Depend I'm, I'm yeah. that. Sorry, it, it depends on how you're transporting it. Do you have it in reefer trucks? Do you have it just in super sacks? Where what, is it, has it been milled? Has is it whole plant? Like, yeah, I, I think generally you're looking at, at about a 50 mile radius. You want to get to that first line processing and get it to a secure site, especially uh, with temperature. And you don't have, if you don't have climate control, then the you know the identity preserve logistics in place. Uh, you definitely don't want to go much further than that. And if you see it's a hot time of year because we've had Novembers and Decembers all of a sudden at harvest time where we've seen 90 degree temperatures. I remember Christmas at 96 degrees on my in-laws deck one time and I was like, what the hell is this, you know, but this happens. So if you start to see um, a temperature swing and you know you've got a harvest within a certain window, go ahead and just find a, a, an old reefer truck that you can lease for, um, you know, for a matter of weeks or, or for whatever period of time it is and go ahead and harvest, put it in there, set your temperature at the right temp. Um, you know, get it down into the, you know, probably the mid to upper 40s. Um, it'll, it'll stop that heat because anybody who's ever laid sod knows what happens if you leave a pallet of sod mm -hmm. out for more than a day or so. You know, um, as soon as you get two or three layers down, there's just that natural, uh, that heat, that breakdown. And that's exactly what's happening with that biomass as it's stacked. So, um, and same thing with flour. You know, we know from harvesting cannabis flour um, for the medical part of it, you know, the minute we harvest, we immediately take it right into, uh, we would, in our case, we wet prune first. We go ahead and trim the plants up before we go to the flour, and then we take the flour immediately into um, a drying room. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do in advance. Um, and again, if you are growing for something like flour, um, that biomass is still usable maybe for something else, for forage. Um, you know, so that you can, if you can't make your window, go in there and if you want to, prune up or prune down the plants and mm -hmm. use that other product. But uh, then creativity yeah. is key. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to add on to what that gentleman asked earlier about pricing and cost. So, um, which is going to answer a little bit of your question as well. So, up north, we found every plant six feet, six, you know, six feet apart from each other. We're looking at a dollar a seed, dollar fifty a seed, up there. Um, if you do clones up there, you're looking between four dollars a clone to fifteen dollars a clone. Uh, you know, obviously we're not doing clones here, but if you're in the clone business, um, one thing I, I, I hear cost a little bit from a lot of people today. No one's talking about the drying process. So make sure if you're gonna get in this game on a large scale, you understand how to dry, because it's just a matter of days, if not a week that all of a sudden mold sets in and your crop is history. And just to add some more numbers, and, and just one last number I'm going to add to you. So I read an article yesterday, um, supposedly in America this year, eight and a half billion dollars worth of hemp will be grown. Eight and a half billion. There's one bottleneck issue. Seven and a half billion will go to waste. Think about that. Am I right on that, Jeff? Are we there? Uh, and yeah. To add to that, you know, it, it is, as you know, we're a commodity industry. This is a supply and demand market. Um, I've got friends that are growing in Tennessee right now. And, you know, last year they saw um, prices in the $30 a pound for, for high quality flour that was grown in high tunnels or in areas that were protected and, and had, a, had a good market. They're looking at a little better than half that this year because, again, a lot more growers, there's a lot more product out there. Um, we know. What we saw, and as you just briefly discussed in, on the Pacific Northwest, with all the cannabis licenses that were out there for recreational cannabis, um, you know, all of a sudden everybody wanted to be in the cannabis industry, and they had nine million pounds of excess cannabis that they didn't have anything to do with, and they couldn't do it. So what ended up happening, all they ended up doing is being the cheapest source to the black market that there was out there, um, because you could buy pounds of cannabis flour for about $100 a pound. I mean, this was 1960s prices and superior weed than what used to come over the border from Mexico. So, I mean, well, there is a little comedy to that. The, the fact is, is that what were they going to do with all that product? How were they going to store it? And what was going to end up happening with it? And unfortunately, there was a lot of businesses and a lot of farms where they borrowed a lot of money in order to do this, thinking that they were going to make a killing to find out that everybody had the same dream, the same idea. Um, we're not here to, by any means, discourage you, but what we are trying to do is make sure that you have your eyes wide open and understand that this is still farming. 
um, and it's new farming. Um, we're, we, some of the equipment hasn't been developed yet. Some of you guys out there, as smart farmers, are gonna be the guys to develop that equipment and find one of those 25,000 jobs that are out there or new industries for it. There are so many industries that are, are happening here, from ice cream to towels to you name it. it it's, just, it it's just amazing what you do. So be creative. D don't follow the pack where everybody is growing a product for the same end user because then all of a sudden you're gonna find your spot price is going to be down because the, the end user is gonna have the same problem on their side with who they're trying to sell their product to, whether it's Coca-Cola or somebody else to put it in a product. You know, it's, it's supply and demand. We have, so, a question. we have a question in the back. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, mobile processing, where they come to the fields, is that, is that happening out west? Where I, I understood there was mobile labs pull right up to your crop then you just, they process it, you divide up, they get a percentage of the crude. There is, there is some in Colorado where there's some guys that are doing, uh, they bring, they have supercritical CO2 machines um, that there's three to four of them on a straight truck or a tractor trailer, depending on access. And they come in and they'll actually process the product there. Um, you know, they work on different things from a feed based or a percentage based. Um, I don't know of any, unless anyone else knows of any other methods uh, that are coming to you as a harvester. And that's also some of the problems that some of the guys right now that I heard out of Tennessee are having is they're getting ready to go into, uh, in, into a harvest thing and they don't know what to do with their product and now they're trying to sell it to somebody who'll come in and take it from them. And you know they may see a buck a pound for something that they were hoping to get 20. And you know that the cost of goods sold and the amount of money that you put into that product with anticipation of making a profit, you know, if you value added a lot of things and made all those extra steps to find out they weren't necessary or they're non-recoverable, you know, that's, uh, that's the part of any business that we need to look at and analyze. So, you know, using a sharp pencil, really having a good business plan and developing these relationships early on before you have that product because when you've got the product and you don't have a place to sell it, then you're at the mercy of the buyer, you know, and you don't want to be at that point. And at long term, I don't know if a, a mobile extraction facility is a, is a viable option. I think uh, with FDA regulations uh, coming about soon, I think there's going to be quality standards and even from uh, institutional purchasers that are going to have uh, certain requirements for how all their biomass is originated and moves through the supply chain. Uh, I, I have serious questions about whether or not that's a, a really a feasible option long term. Uh, it only, it's only kind of here because we're basically in an unregulated market by and large uh, when it comes to some of this stuff. Uh, so I, th I really think, especially in Florida, rather than having a mobile processor, you're going to want to have a good relationship with a, a buying point or a drying point, kind of like a peanut aggregation points or citrus m buying points. It's going to be kind of a similar model to that, if I had to guess, where you're going to need a good relationship with that first stage uh, processor or storage facility. So we have a question back here. Uh, yes, Travis Green with New Green Organics. Um, would field drying be a, a decent method for... Uh, for North Florida, or would would it need to be in some sort of like barn or warehouse, uh, in terms of like the humidity and the the weather conditions? I'm going to be honest. I don't even know if a, a barn is going to be a real viable option here because of the humidity. Uh, I, I think you're going to need some kind of climate controlled storage if you're not doing uh, some other mechanized drying uh, platform. And, and if what's you have, the and if you do it in a covered area and you don't have that option, you know, of, of air conditioning or a climate controlled space, um, you know, don't get cheap on fans. Yeah. You know, the most important thing is copious amounts of ventilation and air movement. I mean, even on the growing end of it in greenhouses, we have the same issue, but especially in the drying part of it. Um, you know, we've we've found ways of, of bending the rules. But there are only so much, you know, and in order to bend those rules a little bit in, in that curing process so you don't get molds, um, which are going to, you know, w w destroy your crop, um, basically, ha you know, have fans at every level and then have exhaust fans. Um, and if you can, and if you can afford it, um, on some of that intake air coming into that space, you know, if it could be HEPA filtered, um, you know, or not even necessarily fully HEPA filtered, it could be like it could be a MERV 11 or 12 air conditioning filter, something that will just pick up and take out um, molds and pollens, other ones. So it, all of these steps help. 
Um, and then it's also too, right before you harvest, look at you know at, at the plant itself. You know, did you just have a rain, or you know, is it is it slightly dry? You know, so timing your harvest too is going to be really important, especially with field crops if you're going to have to field dry, because it's not like the old days of tobacco houses where you know there was a series of racks in the barn and and you know, um, but. In this case, um, you have a dense bud, and it's very, very easy for that flower um, to develop um, botrytis or other um, bacterial molds that will, will show up in there. And um, if they test positive for it, you've basically got a failed crop. Uh, so, and if you do find any of that, separate it and destroy it. Um, you know, it, it's don't try and save it because it's airborne. You know, it's just try to mitigate it and make sure that everybody going in and out of your drying and your areas use alcohol mats or just get a bottle of alcohol, spray the bottom of your feet, wear gloves, um, limit your, your, your touching and your contamination of flour and anything that you're trying to save because all of that is, it's airborne and the, and the more you can, you can protect your crop, you know, the better off you'll be at the end of the day. And what kind of timeline are you looking at from harvest until like, you know, drying or processing before you can expect some sort of like mold depending, or some sort we, of issue we from both happening? both answer that, but depending on the type of plant and how much biomass. Now, if you've already pre-pruned it and you're just drying flour, um, you know, in a week you could, you could have flour down to a level where you can actually start to post-process it. Where, um, but if you're looking at just large amounts of biomass, um, you know, those plants could take, especially depending on their on-center spacing and their layout, you know, you could look at a week or more. And, that, and that's where you start getting into that threshold of mold. You know, um, it, it's, you're creating that perfect storm. So it, when in doubt, always space things wider, add more ventilation, and, and scout, and then always take a very preventative method of handling it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hopefully you've learned something this afternoon. Uh, I got the signal from Chris, it's time to shut up. Uh, we are doing another one of these you conferences. You still got 10 minutes, if you guys want to talk. <laughs> uh, oh, you're taking, keep going. You got 10 more minutes. Oh, here, here's a question back here. But we're doing a conference over in Mariana, the 13th of November. Uh, we'd love to have y'all come over and we'll show you some Southern hospitality. <laughs> This is for anyone that's interested. There is a fellow that I represent, um, Desiree Mufson, um, out of Texas. He's a top guy in oil and gas, and he has developed a, an extraction system that's totally green, has absolutely no waste, and it is uh, in an enclosed environment, totally bomb-proof. So if anyone is interested in that, just get over to me and I'll be happy to share that information, but it's a, a mobile unit that you can set on your property to do extraction. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I got a question for Danny Persaud. Uh, my name is Leland, I'm with Great Southern Forestry, and I'm interested about the selling end of it, the business end of it. Do you have an idea, a ballpark figure, what you might pay on a delivered price per ton basis for fiber? Yeah, uh, we, we, can, we can talk uh, outside after. All right. Um, we've, got, we've, got, we've got some prices on, uh, some clients have reached out to us, um, so we, 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 I'll be more than happy to discuss that with you. Man, I'll be glad to. And this might be a question for the guys at UF. Do you have an idea what hemp pie fiber can produce on a per acre basis on a tonnage rate? We have somebody that can feel that? Anybody? Did you hear the question? I didn't hear the question. Can you restate the question, please? Yes, uh, how much fiber can I grow on a one acre plot on a per year basis in this area? Rough, rough estimate. How, many how much fiber can you produce in pounds per acre per See. year? To give you one, one of my favorite uh, farmer sayings is it depends. I mean, your, your, your cropping system, what you use, what you feed, I mean, it, it, it's variable. You, uh, I've seen fiber yields as low as 5,000 pounds an acre to upwards of 45,000 pounds an acre, uh, depending on, on region, varietal, and, and cropping system. So uh, it, it's a great variance. A bunch. Yeah. I'll accept that answer. <laughs> Thank well, you. We can't say. Our, our tests have always showed that using good organic protocols and a sensible approach to everything um, and not being as reliant 
on typical NPK, salt-based fertilizers, and things of that nature. These plants really, um, and, and having amazingly good soil quality, I would spend more money on, on good mycorrhiza and, and adding to the natural microbial value of your soil and your fields than I would to say in, in adding um, just basic fertilizers or any other thing to them. Because by making those, um, all of the, the nutrients available to the plants, um, in that manner, we found that you get two to three times the biomass production and you get one twentieth of the amount of environmental stress. Um, they don't wilt un under drought conditions and if they do, they recover. Um, as well as, um, you know, we, don't, we see they're more cold tolerant as well. So, you know, there is a lot to be said about organic pro uh, processing and growing that way, which I've done for years and while it, it's a, a fallacy that it costs more um, because it, it really isn't. It, it's just learning a new way of, of doing things. And when you do, you'll see that your yields are better and higher and you have a better biodiversity. You have natural predator insects and things in, that are there that work for you instead of trying to combat continuous problems because of stresses and in insects. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, um, what should we call it? Um, we use soil uh, nematodes to control even things that can fly in, like thrips, which lay eggs that actually fall in the soil before they come up and has an end star. So, I mean, you, there's just so many things that you can do, and there's so much available now in forms of myconicides and various other things that are available. The University uh, of Florida um, has a, a tremendous um, uh, amount of information they can provide you on on the uses of mycorrhiza and also, um, of course, different naturally occurring compounds that can be used as organic pesticides. So, um, and as, as well as, you know, a lot of uh, good uh, horticultural supply places now, it's not uncommon to be able to go in there and, and find as much organic products as you do non-organic. And the reason I stress that is, is depending on where your product goes again, you're going to be testing. And if you're testing something that's either going to go into food or into, uh, into medicine or into any other final product, what you put in it is what's going to come out. Again, remember it's bioremedial plant, it's, so it's in that vascular bundle, it's in the flower, it's in the tissue. You're not going to remove that. So, especially with something that grows in a four month period of time. So your window is, is short, so make sure that the plants are healthy, that, that the product is good and then make sure that um, you, know, you pass your test and get the maximum price for your product. And that's really what we're here about, is making, making money. You know, but, but there are no shortcuts to this to do it really right and to make that highest yield, especially with as much competition that's out there. Find your niche, find what works for you, and, and then be the damn best at it, or even the second best, you're still gonna make money. So, you know, but, <laughs> but. Is there anyone else? Okay. You gentlemen like to make another statement? We have five minutes. Start down no, we'll start, we'll start on that end. <laughs> yeah. I just want to thank uh, Chris, uh, Kristen Dozier, Commissioner Dozier, for having me out here. Really appreciate it. Um, if you guys would learn, like to learn more about us, I'm sitting directly back there, or I'll be outside later on. I'd uh, love to sit down and talk with you and explain to you our process and why we got in the game and the history behind Danica Farms. Uh, Danica Farms uh, is named after my daughter, and it wants, uh, means one who brings light into the world. So that's the meaning behind that name. So I'd uh, love to talk to you, get to know you a little bit better, and maybe we could do business together. Yeah, I'd like to echo those sentiments. I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Dozer for putting this together and inviting me here. It was uh, great to speak with all of you. And, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about my company, it's greenpointresearch.com. And, again, we'll be in the back and we'll be happy to meet with any of you and talk about your interest in the hemp industry. Yep, lots of thanks. Commissioner Dose, thank you. Um, and Jeff Sharkey, wherever you're at, and Taylor, and also Jim for being up here and moderating and learning more about this interesting well, product that hopefully Thank you for help. sharing with us. Uh, and thanks to Holly Bell, if she's still here, for taking time out of her busy schedule to, uh, to join us today and share her personal um, uses of, of cannabis and, and also um, what this plant could do for our great state. Um, you know, we have a lot of opportunity here, and um, the, the key is, is just, you know, 
being creative, ask a lot of questions, and, and take the time yourself to, to really sit down and, and map out your plan, what you want to do and how you're going to do it. Because this is just a new, a new method of farming for a lot of us. Um, but the fact is, it is still farming. We are still dealing with the commodity crop. And there are all the same upscale and pitfalls that apply to any commodity. Um, so just be aware of them. And um, for those of you who don't mind traveling, up in Tennessee uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, up in Franklin County, I just got a, a news alert that they're going to have their first uh, of their big harvest. They're going to have their first big auction up there. And it may be an opportunity for you guys to go up there because you're going to see everything from food, forage, biomass, uh, isolates, um, you know, full spectrum oils, um, and what they consider smokable flour that's going to be available in small amounts to giant totes. Uh, available for auction for the finished industry. The reason I suggest this is at least it's going to give you a heads up on where the industries are going and also where prices are at. And, uh, and you'll see firsthand who the end users are and hopefully you can meet and get some cards of some of the end users or the buyers of these products so that way as they start making their way into Florida, you got a head start with um, some good contacts. So that's it for me. Thanks to the panel, we appreciate it, and thanks to uh, Appalachia Regional Planning Council. I think you've done an outstanding job. Thank you.